Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this Dubai Air Show edition of Defense News Weekly, we're at the premier Middle Eastern aviation event, covering the future of the Air Forces in the region and around the world. We'll find out if the UAE Air Force could get the F-35, see their other latest acquisitions, and get an update on the U.S. Air Force's KC-46 tankers. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly here at the Dubai Air Show. I'm Jeff Martin. Now you might notice that I'm not standing outside like I normally am at one of these air shows, but that's because we've had heavy rain here on the last day of the show, which is not exactly what you normally see in Dubai. But anyway, enough about the weather. Let's get into the news we've had from this show. Some of the top news coming into the show was whether or not we might see advancements on the UAE possibly getting the F-35. But those hopes appear to be dashed. We talked to Undersecretary of Defense Ellen Ward about the UAE's chances to get that advanced aircraft, and she wasn't mincing words. We do not have ongoing discussions um, with the Emiratis right now. We are within the U.S. discussing how we want to end up on this. There have not been any classified briefings. There will not be any discussions this week. And the discussions are all around the region and keeping um, QME and all of the other considerations in balance. We remain very steadfast um, in terms of the F-35 will not um, be in the same location as an S-400. So with the F-35 off the table, it appears, for the UAE, at least for the near future, what else could they buy if they want an advanced fighter? Well, at the top of that list is Russian equipment, namely the Su-35 or the Su-57. So to find out a little bit more about where the UAE is with possible negotiations on those aircraft, I talked to Viktor Kladov, who runs Rostex International Cooperation. Here's what he had to say. We have laid down uh, our proposals uh, uh, for the government's perusal. So uh, the ball is on the other side, and it's up to the Emirate government to decide when and what to discuss uh, next. So we, we are patient. We are open. We are uh, as much open as we can uh, for supplies, for industrial partnership, for transfer of technologies. And whenever our partner wants uh, to get a technology, we look at how much a partner has, can absorb a technology. We give options and then the government to decides, oh, we want to go into this technology or we want to pick up this and that, you know. Uh, normally, it goes in stages. In stages, uh, there is an uh, immediate requirement, then they go for procurement, and then second stage, uh, long term, they look into local production. Every country has uh, its own advantages, you know. Uh, so uh, our main advantage is uh, uh, we uh, we are a very reliable su supplier. We never apply any political tags. Uh, then uh, we are ready to transfer uh, technologies. And the last but not the least, uh, what we propose to our customers is value for money. Now another part of the UAE's modernization of their Air Force is airborne early warning capability, namely the Saab Global Eye. The UAE right now plans to buy three of those aircraft, at least that's what we thought when we arrived here at the show. But in a surprise announcement, they announced that they even have intentions to order two more. So we talked to Saab CEO almost immediately after that announcement to get his take. Contracted back in 2015 for the first two aircraft and then an additional one in 2017. And now they have decided then to go for another two aircrafts. Uh, and we're just about to finalize those negotiations. I think it's uh, amazing. I mean, it shows their trust in us. Uh, it was not really, of course, a big surprise since I know that we are really close to conclude the contract. So uh, it sort of was a little bit expected, but you never know. It's, 
it's really nice. I'm really so appreciative of, of, of the step they've taken. Well, we have a contract that gives them the opportunity to add aircrafts, uh, and I think they've used that. So uh, I, that's why I say it's an amendment to the contract that we have. So it's not sort of a big new negotiation. So I, I expect this to be finalized shortly. Well, in the region, um, I'm not sure really. Uh, there might be a couple of countries interested. Uh, we are initial discussions with a couple of countries and also elsewhere in the world, of course. Uh, both Finland has shown an interest and also South Korea, for example. Uh, so there are a number of prospects that we are working and, uh, and of course now flying the aircraft and showing its capability, it, it gets more and more attention in the marketplace. Another aspect of UAE Air Force modernization is tankers. The UAE has expressed an interest in buying KC-46s to augment their A330 MRTTs. So the U.S. Air Force brought a KC-46 here all the way from McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. While it was out here on a ramp, we got an update on that aircraft's progress from the Ops Group Commander. For our KC-46, the 344th Air Refueling Squadron, the Ravens, uh, they're taking on a whole different mission set as they bring on a new weapon system. As they learn and train their individuals, they train their boom operators. Uh, it, it is a challenge in some ways, and I would say it's not just on the operator side, it's also for our, our maintenance. So our maintainers are also they're trying to maintain uh, KC-135 as well as learning to maintain the KC-46. So it's working with Air Mobility Command to ensure that we have the personnel required to, to do both. Uh, we're tr really trying not to keep our maintainers dual qualified uh, just so they can focus on one weapon system or the other. But as of right now, I don't see it as a challenge per se. I, I think everybody knows their, their job. Uh, they're proud of their job. Our 135 team is very proud of who they are and what they do. And our KC-46 team is very proud of who they are and what they do. So to me, it's exciting to be a commander and watch that esprit de corps build on both sides. We currently have a unit that is made up of 19 different AFSCs or individuals with backgrounds of other airframes that have come into the unit. So we've been able to take these different ideas and cultures and kind of meld them into the KC-46 so we can take advantage of that and build a different culture. As you mentioned earlier, we talked about the KC-135 and the KC-10. Well, with the KC-46, we've got so much more uh, that we're able to kind of open up the aperture and, and bring those individuals into the, into the unit. So currently we have 16 KC-46s at McConnell. Uh, we're expecting delivery possibly of a couple more at the end of the week, uh, at which point uh, we'll have uh, potentially up to 19 aircraft on the ramp. We, we have had challenges with the training throughput. Uh, we call it you know, air crew production, both my pilots and the boom operators. They're, the primary location for our training is at Altus Air Force Base, where we have the formal training unit. Uh, but we've also had the opportunity to train some pilots and boom operators at McConnell Air Force Base in coordination with Air Mobility Command and Air Education Training Command. So we have found ways to produce pilots and boom operators as we work through some of the challenges we had in the uh, aircrew production what pipeline. Were the challenges? So some challenges right now is just uh, the ability for us to, to bring the crew members through a formal training unit that may not have been established uh, before uh, we were able to take possession. I would, as, from my perspective, I didn't see it uh, related to the aircraft uh, delivery. It's just it's working through the, the other constructs of creating a formal pipeline to put individuals through and then off that formal pipeline be able to put them in the squadron. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't equate it to the delays, uh, any delays associated with the aircraft arrival. No, I'm not a boom operator, but I know our boom operators, they're out there executing and training uh, five days a week. Uh, they've had nothing but uh, great things to say about their training and the opportunities we've given them to go up and exercise their, their role as boom operators. So that's been a, a great opportunity. So I think th things are going well for them. There have been some challenges, but I think our senior leaders have been very great at engaging Boeing about those challenges and allowing us as operators in the field to kind of work with what we have. And as I stated, our boom operators are, are getting after training every day, and I don't see a, a problem for them right now. Yeah, so we've had some great opportunities to fly cargo, both the, over in the European theater and the Pacific theater, and uh, unfortunately we did find uh, an issue with the cargo uh, with the cargo locks, but Air Mobility Command was able to work with the program office as well as Boeing to identify what a potential solution will be. And for how I'm tracking right now for my operators, I should have a solution here uh, shortly so we can get back after moving cargo throughout the system and get, building more experience for our boom operators with that mission set. One announcement here at the show is that the Embraer KC-390 is no longer known as that. It's now the Boeing Embraer C-390 Millennium. Now we aren't exactly sure what that name change is gonna do for it. Boeing and Embraer say that it will show that the aircraft is a cargo aircraft with other capabilities. Now what this means for more orders, we're not exactly sure, but one thing is for sure, Boeing and Embraer are gonna use this aircraft to position against the C-130 all over the world. The American presence here at the Dubai Air Show has never exactly been small, but this year, it's pretty good sized. 
So I got the opportunity to chat with Eric Fanning, who's the head of the Aerospace Industries Association, about the U.S. presence and why it's so important for American companies to be here in Dubai. Uh, well, the air shows are always important, wherever they are in the world. We, I don't even know how many actually that we do. Um, because AIA's role fundamentally is a convener, government and industry, and this allows us to meet um, with foreign partners as well. It's, it's been surprising to me in this job how much work we get done at the air shows with people that are based in Washington, D.C., but we come together for a focused purpose and a focused period of time and have really productive meetings. And uh, this has been like all the others in that regard. I, I think it is true that historically deals were cut at the shows. Now oftentimes the shows are forcing functions to announce deals that have taken place before the show. But the, the convening, the meetings, the interaction is still critically important and you see that in who shows up year after year after year. Senior le level government officials from many countries, not just the United States government, and then the senior leaders of the manufacturing companies from around the world as well. But having the Chinese and the Russians here and at the air shows reminds everyone that uh, if, if we don't sell our products, the customers have other options. They want American products. Um, they know the quality of American products is better. The longevity of American products is better. The partnerships that come with them are more desirable. But if those aren't available to them, they have other places to turn. To get more defense news coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple's news app and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, we're going to go inside the Dubai International Air Chiefs Conference to get an update on combat air power from the service chiefs that are revolutionizing it. There's one phrase that has been popping up more and more when you talk about future war, and it's the kill chain. So at the Dubai International Air Chiefs Conference before the air show here, U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff General David Goldfein talked about automating those kill chains as much as possible and even using assets that aren't U.S. Air Force aircraft. A few months ago, we paired a space asset with an ISR asset, with a command and control asset, with a naval asset that were not previously connected. We built a mesh network based on common, and common digital architecture with equal access to both data and artificial intelligence. And then we placed an enemy naval vessel in the scenario. First, the space asset located the enemy vessel using its sensors. But it was unable to complete the identification or gain target quality coordinates. So it queued the ISR asset to get close enough to get both an accurate ID and target quality location. And these were passed to a command and control asset that had a database loaded with various effects from kinetic to non-kinetic, based on the commander's intent, programmed into the algorithm, and it selected a naval destroyer to execute the strike. But here's the most important part. The first human in that kill chain was the naval destroyer, the shooter, with final decision authority to execute the strike based on commander's intent, mission type orders built into the network. Every other part of that kill chain was completed machine to machine at the speed of light. You see, in most kill chains today, there's a human in every step of the loop. But the future will require humans on the loop, not in the loop, making final decisions for lethal or non-lethal fires. Next month, we're on track to demonstrate the connection of an F-22 and an F-35 and a Valkyrie drone with space assets to ensure our fifth generations of platforms, sensors, and weapons can all connect, share, and learn. And then in April, we'll connect Army long-range precision fires in the same mesh network. And on it goes. Every four months, another demonstration. This is no longer PowerPoint. It's real. Now, another air chief to speak at that conference was the British air chief. And he made clear he's not okay with the fact that sometimes if he wants more capable aircraft, he has to buy less of them. We also need to get real about the relationship between cost and capability. Our everyday experience with, with the phones that we all have in our pocket shows that increased capability is not necessarily accompanied by spiraling costs. So that demands an entirely different relationship with our, with our defense aerospace industries. 
because I don't accept that if I want better capability, I will have to trade down numbers of platforms to be able to afford the technology that I need. Dumbed down solutions aren't the answer to deterring and defeating our increasingly high-tech adversaries. I want complex technology, which gives me the decisive edge, and I want mass, and I'm convinced we can have both. They are not mutually exclusive. Now, don't go away. When we come back, we're gonna get more information about why Boeing chose not to bid on the Air Force's next-gen ICBM program. On this week's Money Minute, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her latest tips. The transition from military to the civilian world is a big one. On average, 250,000 service members do it every year. Some take advantage of their post-9-11 GI Bill benefits to pursue higher education, while others look for a job that matches their skills. Of those who enter the workforce, almost half leave their post-military job within a year. While military service translates to skills that are desired by all types of employers, finding the right one takes planning and consideration, especially if you want long-term success. One helpful resource for finding careers for transitioning veterans is Navy Federal Credit Union's list of best careers after service. Both active duty and veterans can use it as a guide to find both a job that aligns with your skills and what you value in work, like a sense of purpose and great benefits. Planning for a career after service also means having a financial plan to go along with it. A good financial institution will help you create a plan for the next phase of your financial life and beyond, even down to what to do with your TSP in preparation for retirement. So reach out to your bank or credit union for tools to help make your transition a smooth one. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief. Delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. Now, when we come back, we're going to go inside Boeing's decision not to bid on the Air Force's next generation ICBM program. The ground-based strategic deterrent, or GBSD program, has long been one of the pillars of nuclear modernization. And for a while, it was a two-way race between Boeing and Northrop Grumman. But earlier this year, Boeing surprised everyone and announced that they weren't going to bid. So here at the show, Boeing Defense CEO Leanne Corrette offered a little insight into why they made that decision. There was a number of factors uh, that were uh, specific to the reason we made the decision to not bid on this procurement. Uh, we felt that uh, Boeing was disadvantaged and that while we could put forward a great technical solution, uh, that in terms of how it was going to be evaluated from a price perspective, uh, that it wasn't going to um, be a level playing field. Uh, we have voiced those concerns. Um, obviously, uh, you know, in any procurement process, you see instances where uh, data is disclosed. Clearly, uh, that occurred during the process. I don't want to leave any impression, though, that that was the sole reason uh, for why uh, we did not bid. It is more to do with the structure um, of the source selection, and we do believe that there are ways to work through that. And again, I would uh, like to reiterate, it is my greatest hope that we can work through this so that the Boeing Company can participate in this very important national program. Cyber threats are no joke, that's, that's for sure. And that was a big theme at the CyberCon 2019 event that was held in Arlington, Virginia just last week. Now while there, Jill Toro talked with Sean Planky at the Department of Energy about some ongoing cyber threats and how to mitigate them. Here's part of that interview. Now they, they will often say this is, they call it the unfunded mandates of government. I'm sure you've heard that before and that's, uh, I don't, but it's, it keeps coming up because you know, there's best practices, but them being private sector, they don't necessarily get the funding to enable those best practices. So how do we, how far have we come in that and what do they do? Um, so when, when we think about uh, incidents, right? I, I like to think about incidents not just as a cyber incident, right? When people say it's an unfunded mandate, they're looking at cyber as, as its own silo. They're saying, okay, uh, I know how to protect against fires. I know how to protect against flooding. I know how to protect against, you know, whatever other incident may occur, an insider threat, right? And then they go to cyber and they say, oh, that's unfunded. Um, as if it's something different. Yeah. Well, the incident is the incident is the incident. It's not a cyber incident or a fire and flooding incident. Um, it's an incident that, that you as a, as a business and us as the government are gonna have to uh, be resilient from, prevent, respond to, be resilient against. Um, so 
so that's a, a characterization of that, right? It's not, we, we have to stop thinking cyber is different than everything else. Um, and, and then on top of that, we, from, from my office's perspective, we're the ESF 12 um, uh, critical, um, I'm sorry, we're, we're the ESF 12 responder according with, with FEMA disaster response, right? So we're saying, how could cyber fit into the ESF 12 responsibilities? Or if you're dealing with a natural disaster, um, how can we ensure cyber defenses are still up uh, during, that, during that natural disaster? I mean, um, case in point would be during Hurricane Harvey, right? Uh, I'll, there are many companies down in the Houston area that were flooded. I mean, it was, you know, they said, what, a 500-year flood? Um, that caused a lot of data centers to, to experience flooding issues or, or um, you know, or rain, water-based water issues. And that, that caused companies to change how they respond, which may change their security posture. Um, how can we, as an ESF-12 responder who's thinking about keeping power down in, in Houston, uh, how can we say, w recognize that issue and say, oh, maybe we need different type of defense measures here because that data center was the cybersecurity um, data center or held cybersecurity functions for that company. How are we thinking about that, right? That's not, that's not a, a, a direct conclusion, but it's, a, it's, a, it's something that could occur due to an event. And, and when we think about cyber and overlaying cyber into disaster response, that's one of the things that we at DOE are thinking about. These are these, their indirect um, effects uh, of a different type of, of a different type of disaster, right? Cross-sectional uh, risk. And so at DOE, we're thinking about how do we how do we provide resiliency there? How do we better respond? How do we consider cyber just like we consider every other um, disaster or threat? Um, or incident. Yeah. So I want to also um, consider the threat posed by a country like China. And I would, I would put this into two categories just based on the reporting we do. Um, there's, of course, the threat of the industrial base and um, China's role in technology and investments in technology and so forth. And then there's China in terms that, that could give them access. And then there's, of course, China as a threat in terms of hacking and trying to take systems down. We'll say so. First, looking at the industrial base, how much of a role or potential role does China have? How much of a threat is that in terms of you know ensuring we have the proper security in place against you know a near peer um, adversary? Right. So the national security strategy, uh, you know, calls China as a strategic competitor, um, strategic uh, adversary. And we have to be cognizant of it, right? I think that dictates the top line. Um, of, of, of where we as a nation are at. And so internal to that, we have to think of where are they trying to uh, compete against us or um, where do they align against us? Um, China, uh, as you know, is a, every, you know, should be no surprise, is a huge trade um, partner, a huge supplier uh, for the, the world. Um, so, so it's looking at uh, where does that pose a, an undue risk for the United States? Um, Do you have an example? <laughs> so when I when I think about it uh, f from an from a um, an energy or a U.S. supply perspective, um, one of the things I think about is uh, Costco. Not Costco, the the box store that everyone is familiar with, but Costco is a maritime. Uh, supplier, uh, they had a cyber attack at their port terminal um, last year on the West Coast. Well, that cyber attack affects the U.S. supply chain, right, because they are a major U.S. supplier. Mm -hmm. So something that indirectly we might think of, we're like, oh, that's a foreign company, they have a foreign issue. Um, what happens when the supply chain is, is, uh, is slowed or delayed due to a cyber attack that we as the United States had had nothing. Uh, we weren't we weren't tracking, right? Um, 
very, very similar was the, the not Petya incident on, on, the, on the other side, right? Um, Russia attacked the Ukraine. Uh, they provided not Petya ransomware or attacked with not Petya ransomware and then hit Maersk, um, which then stopped, uh, it stopped Maersk operations, which slowed down the supply chain in U.S. ports, um, at multiple U.S. ports, at least six U.S. ports. Caused, costing uh, at least a half a billion dollars in, in, uh, in damages or lost revenue, mm -hmm. right? Um, so how are we thinking about that from, from the Chinese perspective, right? They, being a major supplier, um, how does cybersecurity uh, play into uh, the, the efficiency of the supply chain? Thanks for watching this week's edition of Defense News Weekly all the way here from the Dubai Air Show. Now be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and our digital show daily where Valerie and Senna and I have been pumping content into it all week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too.